Hello, I'm glad you're able to watch this message. It'd be great if you could visit sometime, but if not, find a good Bible-believing church in your area. Hope to see you sometime. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you love us. You're good to us. We're grateful that we can actually know you and spend time with you. Thank you that you've made yourself uh, available to us, the true living God who entered our world. Thank you that you've loved us that much. Jesus, thank you for entering our, our world, adding a human nature to your divine nature, for taking our place in the judgment we deserve and rising physically from the dead. We know you've ascended into heaven, waiting for a time to return. You're our hope. Our eyes look to you, and we're grateful that we can know you. You've opened up an opportunity for us to trust you and to walk closely with you. Spirit of God, thank you that you're the one who lives inside of those who have trusted Jesus. Thank you that you're the one who turns us away from those things that are unholy and untrue towards those things that are true and holy. Thank you that you've inspired truth outside, objectively, from ourselves, revealed from you, not that we would continue to go inside of ourselves for anything that's true, Lord. We trust what you've revealed. And we would ask that even this morning that you would help us to understand some of these things that we'll look at. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, there, uh, you might have heard there was a, a guy in a, a rural community who, who was known to be a really good fisherman. And uh, as he was... Uh, continually bringing back boatloads of fish into town, they just, they just couldn't figure out how he did it. And it turns out that the game warden couldn't figure out how he did it either. So he was in conversation with him, and he said, hey, you know, do you mind if I go with you on one of your fishing trips? The man said, sure, no problem. Drove out to the lake that he fished at, boat ride out into the middle of the lake. As they're sitting there, anchored, you know, the uh, game warden starts to pull his pole out, and the man, he opens up a bag, pulls out a stick of dynamite, lights a stick of dynamite. Well, the, the game warden's like, oh, you can't do that. He tosses the, the stick of dynamite into the lake, boom. All the fish come floating to the top, and he's just casually, you know, grabbing them, putting them in the boat, and the game warden's beside himself. You can't do that. That's illegal. I'll make sure that, that, that this never happens again. And the guy would just slowly, calmly pull another stick of dynamite out of the bag, lit it on fire tossed it over to the game warden. The game warden grabbed it. The man said, you going to fish or are you going to talk? And so, <clears throat> you know, the, the subject we'll discuss today requires participation. All right? How are you in the area of participation? And I'm going to ask this in community, in the community. Uh, we're going to focus on the true community of God today. And I want to say this. It's no secret that community... Uh, community, even in the world of people who do not know God, community is involved in molding and shaping people's destiny sometimes. The people that you surround yourself with. That's no secret in our, in our world. And I think in large part because God made us in his image. He made us for community. And so there's plenty of opportunities that people have to be involved in each other's lives that impact each other's lives within communities. When someone decides they want to build a moral foundation for their life, when they decide that they want, to, they want to build a moral foundation for their family, community needs to be involved in that. And the people that you surround yourself with and your children with and your grandchildren with are going to have a large part to do with how they're going to turn out. The people that you give approval to to give input into your kids' lives and even into your own life. You know, in 1951, a rather famous experiment was done by Solomon Ash, and there's even some even original videos of it <clears throat> where, where they were doing experiments on peer pressure. Who in this room doesn't understand the, the impact that your peers have on your life, the pressure that they can put on you for good or worse? Well, an experiment was done where, where a, a, a guy in a lab coat or a woman in a lab coat would get up front, she'd have this uh, card of different length lines that were obviously different lengths labeled a b and c and the room was filled with people who were 
supposedly being experimented on. And a question would be asked, what's the longest line? What's the shortest line? And then uh, around the circle they would go, and each person would say, well, you know, A or B or C. Well, there was really only one person being experimented on in the entire room. One person in that crowd of people who were going to be giving answers was being experimented on. And so the card would be up and the obvious wrong answer began to be given by the people in that crowd. It would go around a circle to the person who was being experimented on. And some of the videos you can see just someone like going back and forth like, are these people nuts? But then out of their mouth comes a conforming statement in agreement with what everyone else has just said. 75% of the time, the people being experimented on, 75% of the time in all those different experiments, someone would give the wrong answer, the obvious wrong answer. 75% of those people would do that. We understand it. We know what peer pressure is like. If you understand it, proper decisions need to be made, especially in the world in the, which the way it's changing here, if you want to build a moral foundation for your family and life. You have to choose the people and monitor the people that you hang around and that you allow your kids to hang around. It has to be done. And uh, Proverbs, uh, we find wisdom being given to us. If you would, sanctified common sense, all right? Where you would... Uh, where a, a father is passing on wisdom to, mostly you hear the masculine language, a, a son. So you have Solomon here, and wisdom is a word that means skill. And so applied here in the, in the proverb, it's always skill at living life God's way. So do you have that skill or don't you? And this father, you can almost hear this plea for his, uh, his son here in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 10 through 19. Many places we can look. He says, my son, if sinners entice you, do not give in to them. If they say, come along with us, let's lie and wait for someone's blood. Let's waylay some harmless soul. Let's swallow them alive like the grave and whole like those who go down to the pit. We will get all sorts of valuable things and fill our houses with plunder. Throw your lot in with us and we'll share a common purse. What's being addressed here? Peer pressure. He's talking to his kid just like any dad or any mom would talk to their children. Don't give in to the pressure of people around you who are fools. That's what he's saying. My son, do not go along with them. Look at verse 15. Do not set foot on their paths, for their feet rush into sin. They're swift to shed blood. How useless to spread a net in view of all the birds. These men lie in wait for their own blood. They waylay only themselves. Such is the end of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the lives of those who get it. You know what this is called? This is called the fellowship of fools. That's what this is. It's a fellowship of fools. The issue could be any number of issues. You can substitute one in here for your own uh, benefit. Well, here's an issue. Well, just plug it in. This is a fellowship of fools. And it always works the same way. You know, there's always the, a great recruitment program. Great recru recruitment program. We want you. You need to be one of us, right? There, there's always a, a great camaraderie involved. You, we can put our arms around each other and go side by side into this venture. And there's clear path for involvement. Here's exactly what we're going to do. The only problem is, with this fellowship, is it has a meaningless purpose that's going to leave wasted lives in its path, you see. A meaningless purpose that leaves wasted lives in its path. That's what every fellowship of fools produces. Whether it's an obvious wrong, uh, 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 meaningless pursuit, or, or something that's more subtle, just takes your, takes your eyes off of what really is ultimately important and diverts your attention into a different kind of fellowship. There's plenty of fellowships in our world. Lots of different things that people can get involved with that involve other people. That can substitute even for the things that God would love for you to be involved with. Listen to this one. Right at the beginning of the Psalms, every young Jewish person was bar mitzvahed. 
They, 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 uh, they come under the law. They become a son of the law. In other words, they're old enough. They're a man now. Now what you're doing is you are personally responsible in your relationship with God to let his law guide your life. That's what it means to be bar mitzvah. He's talking in the very first psalm about something you can mess up a young man's life or a young woman's life. We find, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. What's being described here is someone just walking along a, a path of life and, and uh, uh, happy uh, that they're, they're moving in a certain direction, but there's one problem here. They're surrounded by the counsel of fools. Look what it says. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. You know what a wicked person is? Someone who could care less about God. They really don't care about God. Maybe not in a violent way or in an aggressive way. They just don't want him involved in their life. They want to do whatever they feel like doing. They want to walk in the way that they want to live their life and they don't want to be bothered by any of that spiritual stuff. And so this young man is walking in a direction and he's hearing input and guidance from all kinds of different sources, but mostly those people he's hanging around with. Counsel of the wicked. Well, what happens after a while? You just start getting that counsel tangled in your brain. Everyone else is doing it. Well, you'd start doing it too. That's what it, what it says. It's forward motion is stopped. It says, or stand in the way of sinners. He stopped moving forward. Now he's standing there. What's that mean? He's participating now. Maybe in a small way, he's just taking a step in their direction. Hey, they're not, it's not that bad, Mom. It's not that bad, Dad. It's not that bad, uh, friends. Uh, you know, come on. You know, why, why do you have such a negative attu- attitude about all this kind of stuff? They stand in the way of sinners, start doing what they do. Why? Because you can't, over time, expose yourself to those kind of thoughts continually without any other input and continue to do the right things? Believe the right things? You're going to stand and start to participate if you're involved in a fellowship of fools. It's going to happen. And then what's the third motion we see? Not just standing, now he's sitting. You know those people who grew up in a great home, possibly? I've seen, I've, I can tell you this story 20,000 times over. Of course, that's hyperbole, right? I have a front row seat to it. Kid grows up in a wonderful home, gets involved in a fellowship of fools, and sooner or later, uh, down the line after college, they're sitting in a seat mocking every good thing that they've learned in their childhood, mocking every good word that came to them. There is no God. Are you kidding me? How do you come to that place? You're surrounded by a fellowship of fools. And that's exactly what he's saying. Blessed is a man who does not do that. Right? But, he says, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He exposes himself to God's word. And surrounds himself, I'm assuming, with people who love God too. What kind of community input do you intentionally expose yourself to and your family to? That's a burning question that must be asked in our present culture. Has to be. You intentionally expose yourself to the community you want yourself and your kids to become like. And if you're involved in a fellowship of fools, neglecting the fellowship of the, uh, the people who, who love God and His Word, something not good is going to happen. I guarantee it. What is true community? That's what we're going to focus on today. The foundation, I'm going to say this first, for true community, true community, and when I say true community, I mean the community that should trump any other fellowship that you're involved with. Ah, we're involved with this, we're involved with that. No, what should trump any other fellowship that you're involved with in this world? What is the fellowship above all fellowships that you should be involved with at the expense of any other fellowship if it comes down to that. That's the decision. What is the true community? Foundation for true community is God himself. Now we notice here in Genesis chapter 1 something that we've heard, we've read, possibly if you've been around. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, distinct from the animals, made us with in, in many ways, like himself, not in appearance, but in our capacities. Notice the wording. Let us. That's kind of odd. I thought there was only one true living God. 
Why from the earliest communication are we hearing, let us make man in our image? He's not talking to the angels. They're, angels aren't co-creators with him. There's only one true living God who made everything. So we find in the earliest communication with the word Elohim used that, that there's an allowance for plurality within the one true living God. Well, something that every Jewish person knew, this is their scriptures, the, the Pentateuch, the first five, five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, clearly, clearly uh, help you understand that there's only one true living God. There aren't many other gods. They were in the middle of a, different cultures that believed in many different gods. And so the Shema became their, their uh, primary uh, 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 mantra. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, Shema is a Hebrew word that means hear. It's a word translated here, hear, O Israel. Pay attention to this. If you pay attention to nothing else in your current culture, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is only one. In essence, true living God. We find in, as things unfold in the New Testament especially, in Matthew, for example, in, in chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, we find this. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the, what? The one name, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Sounds like he's saying there's three. Is the Father God? Absolutely. Is the Son God? Absolutely. Is the Spirit God? Absolutely. Is there more than one God? Absolutely not. How do we understand this? God exists as community. Let us make man in our image. And we find here that existing as community, God calls us into community as well. Because he made us in his image. He wants us to be a part of community, foundationally because he exists as community. We find the second thing I want to share is that God made every believer a member of his true community, whether they want to be or not. I don't want other people around me. Tough. If someone put their faith in Christ, and it's exactly it, a believer, and primarily when, when someone thinks of salvation, the, the, the word salvation is used in the Bible, it means to be rescued from something. I mean, rescued from an eternity without God, uh, brought into uh, the uh, hope of an eternity with God, eternal life. I get eternal life. I don't get eternal death. Okay? So that's what salvation is. You realize that salvation is primarily a relationship with the living God. That's what it is. He invites you into a personal relationship with himself. And because you have a personal relationship with the true and living God, you live forever. Because you've entered a relationship. Sometimes we don't think of it in terms of relationship. I mean, you think about uh, friends that you have or people that you know in your life. Uh, could you imagine someone doing some terribly offensive thing to you? And just ignoring it. Uh, they know they did it. You know they did it. Maybe you've had this happen before. And they're pretending like nothing happened. They're laughing. Ha, ha, ha. Cracking jokes. They're coming back into your presence. And they've never dealt with the issue. How close are you guys? There's been no reconciliation. There's been no acknowledgement of the pain they brought into your life. There's been no acknowledgement that they did something wrong. They just want to smooth it over and make sure everything's good. You know, a lot of people are going to think they're going to dance into heaven that way. Ha, 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 I've been running my own life. I've been doing whatever I feel like doing. From my birth on up, and I've been doing whatever I feel like doing. And you helped me sometimes, but when you didn't, I, I don't care. I'm just going to do whatever I feel like doing anyhow. Ha, 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 Lord, you're supposed to accept me, right? No. No. Because you never turned to me, received what I've provided for you to be forgiven, confessed what you've done wrong, and asked me to forgive you. There's been no reconciliation. There is no relationship between us. You see, that's why Jesus came into the world. 
Living God himself stepped out of heaven and added a human nature to his divine nature because he knows that we cannot live up to his expectations. We have fallen far short. And if we were to face the judgment ourselves, we would spend an eternity without God. He took our place in the judgment that we deserve. See, that's what we primarily need to understand. And in order to have a personal relationship with the true and living God and spend eternity with him, we have to say, I'm sorry. I was wrong. You're right. Will you please forgive me for what I've done? I want what you've done applied to my life. Please forgive me. His death took care of your sin. He rose physically from the dead because it's not just a fantasy myth. Oh, cool. A man in history died, but he's in the grave, and my sins are forgiven. No. He came out alive, walked around for 40 days, and then ascended into heaven. And when we turn to him and say, I thank you for what you've done for me. I was wrong. I've offended you, and I'm so sorry about that. Please forgive me. Change me. I want a relationship with you. See, salvation is all about community with God. Reconciliation with him. Right? Now, John chapter 17, verse 3, as Jesus is talking with his father, he says this. Now, this is eternal life. This would be, make perfect sense. That they may know you, the only true God. What is eternal life? The knowledge of God. A relationship with him. And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Okay, when that happened, when you put your faith in Christ, if you're a believer here today, you were united with Jesus forever in a profound personal way. That's what he taught in, in John 14, 20. Look at this. On that day, you will realize, what are you going to realize? That I am in my Father, that you are in me, and that I am in you. You realize the connection that you have for all of eternity if you put your faith in Christ? You have been united with him. You entered a, a, the closest relationship you could possibly ever enter. And, and the shocking realization of that on the final day is going to blow our minds. We have intimacy with Jesus. Do you realize also you were united with other believers? And you go, oh, man, no. Because there's some people you look around and go, I can't be united with that person forever. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, the body is a unit. And this is what's being taught here. Though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. Great illustration. Look at your own body. Look at someone else's body. There's a unit there, but there's different parts. And coordination added, possibly, you can lose an arm and still be you, right? You can lose a part of your body and still be you. But parts are added to the, are, are part of the body that are coordinated. There's one body, but many parts, right? We get it. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized, and this is called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When you put your faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit did something to you one time that united you with him forever. And here it is. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. So God united people together who have put their faith in Christ and, and into one body, he says. Whether you like it or not, other believers are united with you for all of eternity. And I know you're thinking of some people who don't. I, when I was doing this, I prepare, uh, preparing this, I thought of someone that was a particularly distasteful to me when I was in high school. I mean, I, I was on the baseball team. He was a second baseman. I was a short st shortstop in high school. And he... Uh, uh, he, he would do all kinds of things to irritate me on the field and off, right? Uh, trading off the bag when, when the throwdown came, you know? He grabbed it one inning, I'd grab it the next, but I wouldn't grab it the next. If I was too slow, he'd be there for the, the tag, and I'm like, you know what I mean? That kind of stuff. And so when I graduated, I was, you know, went off to college, Michigan State University, and man, my life changed. I mean, I had put my faith in Christ earlier in life, but it's one of those things where you go, I don't know, did I really know him or didn't I? I got baptized, but when I got to college, it was one of those things that absolutely transformed the way I thought about life. There is nothing greater to live for than Christ. 
I had this wonderful awakening experience when I was at college. I wanted to live for him the rest of my life. I'm still doing it. It was something that, that absolutely grabbed my attention. And my sister, the following year, when, when she came up, uh, she, she gave her life to Christ and started following him with all her heart. And she came to me one time and she said, she said Ben, I know we're going home this weekend, but I've got to ask you something. Can Matt ride home with us? Well, he was the guy that irritated me. Evidently, he was at school, too, at Michigan State, and he needed a ride home. And I had to drive him two hours home in my Mustang. And so I'm sitting there, okay. And so Matt's sitting in the back seat, my sister's in the front seat, and we started talking about Jesus in the car. And he's leaning forward, he's going, what? He's asking questions about the Bible, asking questions about Jesus. And, and, and all the right questions... Like God had opened up his heart to show him the emptiness of life without him. And I'm looking at my sister going, what's happening in the back seat? You know? And, uh, and it came to the point where uh, uh, I, I, I asked him, you think you might want to just talk, talk to Jesus and ask him to change your life? He said, I'd love to. We'd have to pee real quick. Can you pull over? And so we did. We got out of the car, and I'm going, he's going to get back in the car, and that's going to be it. He got back in the car, he said, Okay, what do I do? Led him in a prayer in the back seat. I hated him when he got in the car. I totally loved him halfway home. Why? Because he, he was united to me in the same family, in a relationship with the living God for all of eternity. I actually spent some time with him, helping him get his faith established and learn the Bible a little bit more at school. He unites us together with other believers. The presence of God is in the church. Something else to consider here. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. You know what the church is? The church is a building, I guess, an analogy he uses as a, a body and also a building. Where bricks are being added to this place of worship or a temple, if you would. And uh, each brick is you and I who come to Christ, we're added to it. But who is indwelling and, and in the midst of this whole building is the Spirit of God uniting us together. As this building goes up, this place of worship. And so uh, the presence of God is not only in you, but among us and all around the world among us as believers. I'm going to say this. Jesus loves the church. He loves it. Now, I haven't defined church yet, because we haven't actually seen the word used for church until this verse. Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And I'm going to read the rest. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. You might be going... Wow, that's a little confusing. But what he's doing is he's using the relationship of Jesus with his people, the church. Uh, church, uh, this word is a Greek word, ekklesia, which means a called out assembly. Among the Greeks, uh, a political assembly might form and people would come out of their homes into public and they would rally or whatever they would do. That's a called out assembly. Well, that word was used for God's people. We, we, we see it translated church, but the word is used for God's people. A called out assembly of God's people. That's what the church is. That's why we gather together. That's why we meet. This isn't a, bil a church isn't a building. Sometimes people go, I'm going up to the church. Well, that's wrong lingo. I'm going up to where the church meets. See, we're the church. The people are the church. We could go meet under a bridge somewhere and still be the church. We're God's people. But he's using an illustration here. It's a wonderful one because what Jesus did is he cleaned us up. When we put our faith in him, he washed us clean. He cleansed us. He made us radiant. Uh, there's no more stain on your life from the beginning of your life to the very end. Even some of the things you haven't even seen yourself do yet, he already knows and he's forgiven already because he's taken your entire life and he's washed it clean. And he's brought you to himself, united you with other people. And you have this wonderful image of a traditional wedding here, you know, maybe, where 
where the bride is dressed in white and, you know, the groom is up front and, and all the people are standing there waiting. And what happens when the bride walks through the door, man? Everyone stands up. And the groom is coming to tears. Sometimes. Watching her come through the door with her dad. And she's like, everyone's like, oh. she's all white, shiny. It's as shiny as you'll ever see your wife, man. She's in that wonderful place. I mean, what woman goes into a restaurant dressed like that? You're not going to see her that shiny again. She's got her hair done well. Everything is done. She's just got this white dress on. Could you imagine someone showing up at a restaurant in a white dress, all dressed up, duded up like that? Like, what kind of weird situation is this? But here in this setting, a woman comes up the aisle to see her, her groom, right? Washed clean, spotless. That's a, that's a picture he has. This is, you know what I'm saying? Jesus loves the church. If someone from the aisle, halfway up, with this shiny, shiny woman that's coming, uh, going to be united with this man comes up and just psh, slaps her in front of everybody, what would happen? At least the groom would be down there dogging it out with that guy. And everyone in the congregation probably would be on top of him. Just slap the bride in front of everybody. I'm going to tell you this. I've heard Christians slap the bride before. And Jesus loves the church. This is exactly what he did for the church. He died for the church. To bring people to himself. To unite them together into a family of people that are his. To clean them up shiny and bright. And someone has the audacity to start digging on the church. Who's a believer? How do you think that makes Jesus feel? He's about ready to jump down there. You see? He loves the church. He died for the church. The church is very valuable to him. It's no fellowship of fools to him. This is the fellowship that trumps all fellowships upon this earth. All fellowships. He loves the church. Now say this, Jesus is head of the organization. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, look at this one. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And so we have this image again of him of the body of Christ, but with him as the head. He's the, he's the organizer of this operation. Not only is the church an organism as a body, but it's also an organization. It's organized for a purpose, his purpose. You know, every now, now and then, I, I, as well as you, might have run into a believer who has a negative attitude towards the church. They can't have any, anything good to say about organized religion. And what I usually do is I say, how would, you like your, how would you like your religion? Disorganized? We organize the things we care about. God organizes the things he cares about and loves. I mean, we would never say, I, I hate organized sports, but I sure hope the Seahawks win next week. No. If, if you know, knew that the Seahawks were not organized and you saw clear evidence of it, you'd be screaming for a new coach. You know? God put the head to the church on straight and the church is organized under him. There's a reason that it is the way it is. Number three, God calls every believer to decide to do this. And I'm speaking to you believers here today. To commit yourself to a local church. What should be the natural conclusion we come to regarding these things? You know, a local farmer had stopped coming to a small country church. And, um, you know, the folks there at the church, they, they dressed up. You know, they had suits on and stuff. And the um, pastor went over to see why, why he wasn't coming anymore. And the guy said, oh, man, I don't have clothes. You know, I just show up in these, these run-down clothes that I have on. And I just don't feel like, you know, I feel like people are looking at me and stuff. The pastor went back to some folks. He said, look, we've got to buy this man a set of clothes. It feels good to come to church in. So they, they bought him a set of clothes and took it over to him and said, whoa, thank you. Next Sunday, they didn't see him. Pastor went over to visit him and said, well, what's going on? We didn't see you last Sunday. He said, man, I put that suit on. I did my hair right. I was looking in the mirror, and I'm going, man, 
you look good enough to go to that big Presbyterian church across town. So <laughs> that's where they, they saw him next. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, a very clear communication to believers about worship. Okay? He says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Some are in the habit of doing that. I've known plenty of people through the years who just get in the habit of doing something else on a Sunday morning whenever the church meets. They just are in that habit. Why? Because they... Now, we're going to answer that in a second. Yes. The question is, why don't they eagerly value involvement in that way? Is, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. There's a time when Jesus is going to come back, he's going to return, or he's going to snatch you up into his presence. It may happen before you die, or when you die. But we're looking forward to something that's not just part of this world, leaving God out, up to the second law of thermodynamics, so everything just spreads out, gets eventually dark and lifeless. What kind of hope is that? There's no hope for people that leave God out of their life. We gather together and we go, there's a future for us. He's the one that made this world. Yes, it's winding down, but he's going to return. He's going to remake everything one of these days. We have a hope. And we gather together and we renew that hope every time we meet. You believe this stuff? Absolutely. You, you don't even know someone across the room. And you look over there, they're here. They, they, they're into this, man. And so am I. This isn't the only life we have. We have the living God in our lives. He's united us together, and we're on a journey together, and we're looking forward to seeing him one of these days, and we want to live for him in this world. Okay? So that's what this attitude is. We're in this together. And, uh, you know, why don't people value or eagerly commit to a community of believers? Who are believers? Who are Christians? I'm talking to Christians here. I would say, number one, there's a cultural move towards isolation. People love being individuals. You know, that's one of the things I hear from, from people who come to uh, the United States from other countries and other cultures. There's not that community, that sense that I need other people. They rely on each other as a community. We're not out talking to each other in the street. We love to be in our own little worlds. The second thing is Christians find help outside of their local church. They don't really value the church for the input they, they need. They don't really value the church for the community they need. Nah, they've got neighborhood community, man. We've got a barbecue going on this weekend. We've got uh, some kind of counseling session set up with somebody. Oh, he doesn't really go to the Bible for his, his, uh, his uh, underpinnings for his counsel to me, but, you know, it sure helps me. Support groups for different various things. Internet, you know, sports teams, man. I mean... There's all kinds of fellowship you can find in this world. There's plenty of help you can find outside the church. There's also Christians are ignorant of the truth. This is what we're talking about here today. You just do not have the perspective that God has about this community that should trump any other fellowship in your life. Now, Jesus intended his mission to be carried out through local churches. Look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. Again, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, Jesus said, after he's been raised from the dead. He's saying his last words to his disciples that it should be intended to leave an impact on what's done after he ascends into heaven and before he returns. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. I want people to be my followers. This is your mission baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Baptism and teaching. We're going to have some baptisms today. Uh, people who have committed their life to Christ and we're going to rejoice and say, man, that's awesome. We love this. We love what, what you've decided to do. We love what God's doing. We value it. See, that happens in the context of a local church. Teaching happens in the context of a local church. In the community of believers, where things can be discussed. Okay? The second reason, uh, that uh, thing that uh, most Christians are ignorant of, is, and I'm going to say this, the Apostle Paul, who God used uh, under his inspiration to write most of the New Testament, or much of it, uh, 
organized and sacrificed for local churches to come into existence. If you've ever read the New Testament, he was pummeled in places that he went to bring the gospel to people. People chased him down. But what was he intending to do? To start local congregations of believers all around the place where he, he was uh, inhabiting at the time. He, he sacrificed and, and he organized. Look at Titus chapter 1 verse 5. He's giving instruction to a young pastor. He said, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. What he's saying is, local churches need to be established with local leaders. That's your job. He's organizing local churches. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, now listen to what he, Paul says here. It's, it's interesting. He says, now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up, this is interesting, in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. What are you saying, Paul? That Jesus needed you to suffer too so that people would become Christians? Absolutely not. Jesus did everything we need to come into a personal relationship with him. But I'm suffering so that Christians will come together in congregations and do what God wants on the earth. I'm filling up in my flesh so that you can have a clear path to be everything God wants you to be. That's what he's saying. He wanted to form churches. Now, I'm going to speak only to Christians here in what I'm about to say. When you deny the local church your participation and your service, you're denying God's plan. Absolutely. Denying God's plan. If you understand what he's done here, you're denying God. Jesus loves the church. He died for us to bring us to himself. He wants us involved in his work. At best, your cavalier attitude towards the local church will show your ignorance, really, of God's plan. That's what happens. If you're a believer, you're a believer, okay? D.L. Moody was an evangelist of a, a previous generation, and uh, he was talking to a prominent businessman one time, and, and this businessman uh, said this, I, I believe I can be just as good a Christian outside the church as I can be inside of it. That's what he said to Moody. They were in a room with a fireplace. And so Moody just kind of looked at him real quick, smiled a little bit, walked over, grabbed one of those pokers that you use to poke, uh, you know, the, the, the logs on a fire. And he broke off a part of the, the orange coal, you know, that was on flame and hissing there. And he, he broke it off and he, he just shoved it out onto the hearth. And it was glowing red. There was some fire. Then the fire went out. Then the red went down. And it was just totally black sitting there on the hearth. He didn't, Moody didn't say a word. He just looked over at his friend and smiled. And his friend looked at him and smiled and said, I get it. I get it. The question is, do we get it as Christians? This world can offer a lot for us. A lot. A lot of not really what's ultimately important. And when you separate yourself from what God's doing in that glowing red coal and shove yourself over in this direction, separating yourself from other believers who love God and are doing what He wants, you have just, you have just started a downhill um, uh, problem in your life. You're going to go out. See, that's we weren't intended to do that. Last thing I want to share is this. God's work is accomplished through small groups, small gatherings in each church. You've got small churches that kind of function that way. Then you have bigger churches. And I say that because, I mean, really, someone on this side of the room might not know someone on that side of the room in each service. You might not even know someone who comes to the first service, right? But how much impact are you going to have on someone's life like that? You don't even know. You're not. The people that God will use in your life are a smaller group of people that you get to know who are believers. Those are the people God will use in your life to mold you and that he will use you in their life to mold them. Here's what happened when the first, uh, the, uh, the first church formed, right? Jesus died in Jerusalem, uh, uh, it was put in a tomb, and then his body was gone. 
And most people in that town were scratching their heads, but the disciples and others around who Jesus had appeared to over a period of 40 days knew exactly what happened. He came out of the grave alive. And in Acts chapter 2, we see Jesus delivering on a promise to, to give them the Holy Spirit. And that's what happened. Peter stood up with great boldness. He started in Jerusalem, where Jesus was crucified, uh, and maybe 10 minutes away for a walk from, from where he was buried, he starts telling people in Jerusalem, you have crucified Jesus, the Lord, the Messiah. 3,000 people put their faith in Jesus right there in Jerusalem. And it's a miracle. And they were baptized that same day. And day after day after day, many hundreds and even thousands more started coming to Christ. And we get a pick peek into the early church in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to, I love the way this is put, the fellowship. The fellowship that trumps all other fellowships in this world. The fellowship. To the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to everyone as they had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What a wonderful peek into the early life of the church. You see, all the things that um, uh, people share together as God's people, prayer together, a, a further understanding of God's will through his word, encouragement and support even financially for people in need. All these wonderful things were happening. In a large setting, they would get together in public, but then you find that they met in homes, in smaller settings, where they would share a meal together, they would share more intimate things, they would pray together, they would know people in those little environments. Thousands of people in public, and then there were people meeting in homes. If you think about 2020 vision for a moment when you go to the eye doctor that's what you want perfect vision 2020 vision well if you want to understand perfectly what what uh, possibility of what God might want to do see a little bit clearly what he was doing in the church we find in Acts 2020 like that Acts 2020 the apostle Paul is talking to some elders or, or shepherds of the Ephesian congregation and he's sharing with them what he intended and did among them. And he says, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, listen to this, would have taught you publicly and from house to house. There was a large group meeting, and then there were small group meetings. And, you know, we, we came up with a real creative term for the small groups in our church. We call them small groups. You like that? It was, it was a burst of creativity there for a moment, you know? But it describes what happens uh, when uh, smaller amounts of people get together on a regular basis. It feels like church, but smaller, where people get to pray for, with each other. They hear God's word. They maybe eat together. Uh, they might do a service project. There's knowledge of one another. There's encouragement. Uh, people know what, what, what uh, problems someone might have, and they know what with joys to uh, rejoice with in other people's lives. And many of you here uh, possibly have been involved in a small group. You can say, stand up and probably say, man, it's the best thing I ever did. I've seen groups where people through the years uh, that aren't even a part of the church uh, anymore, years ago that were involved with a small group, I still see them on Facebook talking to each other and encouraging each other and doing stuff with each other. Why? Because that's exactly what God calls us to in personal intimate relationships encouraging each other in that way. What happens in a church setting, a small church setting, a small group setting, uh, that will never happen apart from one? Here's something in Philemon, Philemon, verse, uh, verse 6. We, we find this, this uh, ex-slave who became a Christian in the presence of the Apostle Paul in Rome 
who ran away and stole from his master called Philemon. And uh, this little teeny book written because this slave comes back at the urging of the Apostle Paul to make things right with his old master. And so this note is going to the old master and he's saying, look, receive him back. Treat him just like he's a brother of Jesus. He's now your brother. How are you going to treat him? And here's what he said. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith. You know what that word is? Koinonia. Fellowship. That you would be active in fellowship. There's a house. There's a church meeting in your home. Philemon. And, and Onesimus is going to become part of it. How are you going to treat him? What are you going to do in his life? The way that you interact with someone face to face is going to determine whether you understand anything that God's taught you. And that's why he says, so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Can you learn anything apart from those kind of intimate relationships among believers? No. You will not grow the way God wants you to. That's what this is saying. You will not grow the way God wants you to. You have some contorted view of things that you really haven't experienced and known. You can learn information. A lot of people learn information. Atheists learn information about the Bible. They'll be able to quote stuff to you. Satan does. He knows it inside and out. He'll quote you stuff. We see it in the Bible. He quotes stuff. But you will not grow in your knowledge of Christ apart from these experiences. Something else that happens in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, we find encouragement happens. We can give courage to somebody else. Someone else can give you courage. And that's what it says here. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. That happens in close quarters with people that you know. Small groups. And so, uh, let me close with this. <clears throat> I'm going to use an illustration uh, and just read you a paragraph that came out of a book written back in 1981 called The Wild, Wonderful World of Parachutes and Parachutists. You're going, what? I didn't really read the book. It was just passed on, this little quote, and I found it. It said, 3,000 frightening feet above the ground, Soviet sport parachutist Yuri Belenko realized he was in trouble. His main chute had malfunctioned, and his reserve chute barber poled around the main, rendering them both useless. Kicking his feet to slow the natural spiral caused by the noisy whipping canopies above, Belenko yelled down to his fellow jumpers on the ground. His jump buddies sprang immediately into action, grabbed a packing mat, and sprinted towards the impact point. All the way down, Belenko yelled and tugged furiously at the static lines in a vain attempt to clear the two tangled chutes. Below... His friend stretched the mat taut and waited. Belenko plummeted into the canvas at bone-crushing speed, ripping the tarp from the rescuer's hands, knocking them to the ground. And when the dust cleared, Belenko lay gasping for breath and complaining of a sprained ankle. In addition to the injured leg, he suffered a few bruises. Here's the best sentence, though. His jump buddies were there for Belenko, at the moment he needed them most. That's a great line. Jump buddies were there. That's what small groups do in, in the middle of churches. You find some jump buddies. And people, people who are there for you. And can walk with you through life. Who will pray for you and who care about you. Right? How many of you can understand that life can beat you up and challenge you? A lot of decisions are made in the context of fellowships that you shouldn't be involved in. What God calls us to is the fellowship. If you're a believer in Jesus here, the fellowship. And he wants you to be surrounded with people who will give you encouragement and be your partners as you walk through this life together a little bit. I'm going to share with you something that I shared with some of you before. I, I, my mom, when I was younger, I, my dad was in the Navy. We would move from place to place at times. And she would find a church in each place eventually and then we would go there on and off you know and uh, so I grew up with a warm feeling towards the Bible and a warm feeling towards Jesus and God and uh, I was even baptized at one point as a kid I really couldn't quote you anything out of the Bible I never really read it myself 
I was never involved in a children's ministry. I was never involved in a youth group. So I wasn't surrounded by people who loved Jesus and really wanted to know God and live it out. I would just go every now and then to the big meeting, like this, with my parents. And uh, with my mom. My dad wanted nothing to do with it. And, uh, <clears throat> and so I remember one time, don't remember a lot, but I remember one time we were sitting in a service about this size. And um, I'm next to my mom. The singing just got done and people were sitting down, but she stayed standing up. And I'll, I'll never forget the words that she said. I'm just in high school. She said, I can't take it anymore. And she was yelling this out in the crowd. I mean, could you imagine that? Someone here doing that? I mean, we'd treat them appropriately. We'd pray for them. They did that with my mom. You know, but she, I can't take it anymore. She started weeping. And me as a young high school dude, I'm looking at her in horror. I didn't even know she was going through that. I, I didn't know all that stuff was going on. You know, and of course, appropriately, they came up, they put their arms around her, and they prayed for her, which we would do here. So if you want to stand up and scream something like that, you'd be surrounded <laughs> with people who care about you and pray for you. But that's an inappropriate context, isn't it? Why did she feel the need to do that? Because she didn't know anybody. It's just simply that. She didn't know anybody who she could call on the phone and say, can you come over, man? I'm... I'm going through some stuff. Or she didn't have a group that she was involved with where, where, where some, some two or three or four or five Christians uh, could just say, well, I, man, that's tough, man. Let's pray with you over a period of time. It had to build up to that point where she would just blurt it out in public like that. That shouldn't be the story in any believer's life. It shouldn't be the story in any unbeliever's life. It can come to the true fellowship in this world. And find ultimate peace and hope and joy in every good thing. So, Lord, we come to you. We're grateful that we can know you. Thank you that we can trust you and call on your name. Thank you that you walk through life with us, that you provide true hope for us, true meaning in life, not the empty way of life that people have around us and their, their fellowships they're involved in. I thank you, Lord. I pray for anyone who does know you and loves you with all their heart that they would continue to walk closely with you and invest themselves into everything you call them to. I pray for any believer who's just turned away from you on their own path right now trying to figure life out on their own, but away from you and the fellowship that you want them involved in. Lord, I ask that you would do a work in their life that would bring them to a full understanding of what you want for them and a, a return and alignment with you. I pray for anyone who doesn't know you yet here, Lord, that you would continue to open their understanding, open their minds, that they might come to that place. They would trust Jesus to forgive them and to give them true life. I'd like you to keep your heads bowed for just a moment and your eyes closed. <clears throat> I'm not going to ask anyone to come forward or raise their hand or anything. Just a moment of prayer in your hearts as you talk to God. If you're a, a believer who's following Him close, just tell Him what you appreciate the most about Him and what He's done for you. If you're a believer and you've wandered away, in some way. This would be a great time to tell him you're sorry for doing that. That you were wrong. That you want to be aligned with everything he wants for you. And if you're not a believer yet, this might be the point where you're thinking, I want to be. I want to know you. It would be a great time to tell him that. You trust what he's done for you to forgive you for your sins. I'm going to pray a simple, simple outline prayer that you might think, that's exactly what I want to say to God. And if it is, go ahead and use this as you talk to him in your heart. There's nothing wrong with that. Lord Jesus, I need you. I've done a lot of things that you hate. 
I trust what you did for me. I know you're alive. Would you forgive me? Would you come into my life? Would you change me? I want to live for you. In your great name, Lord Jesus. Amen.